I've done research <laughs> and I've been practicing in the car, my response, and I was trying to think of a way to be like wax poetic or be effusive or esoteric about it. And uh, I realized I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Um, for me, uh, I've had an interesting trajectory uh, that has brought me into wine, and then I was out of wine for uh, particular reasons for a number of years, and now I'm back into it. And I think my definition of, or my rationale for why wine is very different today than it would have been when I moved out here in 2004. Mm -hmm. um, I've become more, a little bit more proletarian in my views of wine. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert um, in wine. I, you know, I, I'm not a, I wasn't a sommelier. I don't have um, you know, a, a, a long, deep knowledge of world wines and producers um, you know, from obscure regions particularly. Um, I just don't have the brain space for that. Um, I'm just a simple winemaker. I, I feel like I, I've learned how to make Willamette Valley wine and I know the region. And for me, there's two parts to why wine. There's the what is wine and why, why do I dig it? And then there's the lifestyle or there's the occupation of wine. So for me, wine as a commodity or a thing I've really developed this, uh, wine is, is bottled community. Um, wine is this special product that brings people together, even if it's just you and someone else. Um, I've been telling people about this uh, quite a bit, uh, in, now that I'm kind of getting out there and talking to people about my brand, um, I, you know, I rarely open a bottle of wine by myself. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's usually someone else there, and we share that bottle. And we may, t we may talk about the wine as we're enjoying it together, but um, we might not. We could talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers, which is great. Um, and the fact is, is that that bottle has basically brought us together at that moment. And what I think is really cool about wine, particularly solidly made wine um, that's terroir driven or varietally, you know, on point, is that um, you do take a moment to savor it. And um, that's not the same with a lot of other things that we imbibe. Um, there's something, I mean, the event, I got to do an event last night and um, there's a convivial spirit with wine and sharing it with not just consumers who are interested but among other winemakers who are endlessly curious about well what did you do with that and oh wow that really turned out well and um, some of you in the honest admissions of like well I wasn't really expecting that and I'm I'm surprised that it came out that well and that's really cool I mean there's just a, there's it's bottled conversations right um, and I think I really appreciate the present moment or I guess the present mindedness um, of wine um, and that's what you know for me as I said like I might have a really great burgundy if you ask me the producer of you know I could say oh man I have this really great burgundy you know at this restaurant and if you say well who was it who was the producer I'll say I have no idea um, I'm the same with song lyrics you know I'm the same <laughs> with like celebrities names like it's just because to me it's really like I can be fascinated with what's in that bottle and really appreciate it. And I might research it, but to me, it's all about that, that temporal moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't really have that, that belief when I moved out here. To me, wine was this sort of esoteric thing that we put on a pedestal. Um, I was working for one of the more preeminent wineries at the time, and you know, I couldn't even afford the wine with my discount. And to me, that was wine. Mm -hmm. um, and now I, I, I feel like wine, you know, is really meant to be something can enjoyed by the masses, you know, neighbors, friends, family, and it really, it really doesn't need to be this pinkies out pretension, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think wine goes great in a coffee mug, and um, and you can enjoy it without without pretense. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of like the why wine for me. 
um, from a product standpoint. Mm -hmm. From an occupational standpoint, um, why not? Uh, you know, it's fun. Uh, uh, I love being physical. You know, I am, I am 44 years old and I am still climbing barrels like I did 15 years ago. Um, I have uh, out endured people half my age during harvest. I feel, I'm pr I feel proud about that. Uh, I might it might take longer to recover, but, but like, you know, um, it keeps me young and it's physical and every day is different. Um, I've grown to like Carhartts, um, you know, uh, but I also, uh, it, it allows me to be creative for sure. Um, there's a very positive stress that goes into that, you know, am I doing the right thing? I want to create something that people like and want and, um, so there's, there's, there's some extrinsic as well as intrinsic motivation there. Um, but it also allows me to be a better dad. And a, uh, you know, I have the flexibility to um, pick up my daughter or take her to school. Um, you know, it's like those little things. Like, so outside of harvest, you know, harvest is obviously a different story, but um, there is sort of a flexibility in the industry and then there's that camaraderie and collegiality um, that is unlike any other industry. I mean, I've worked, I've worked in a lot of different industries. Health insurance was my first gig, uh, PR, uh, restaurants, you know, and, and uh, teaching. And, uh, and the wine industry, both from when you're engaging with people who are patronizing you, um, as well as people in the business, there's, there's a spirit of, of uh, camaraderie um, and collegiality that is uh, pretty addicting. I mean, it's, you know, and I'm an extrovert, so like I, 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 I love opportunities to be um, among people. And again, going back to my definition of, for me for wine, wine brings people together. So it's all, it's all part and parcel, you know, occupationally speaking, uh, it brings me into that fold. And, um, uh, I think it's healthier, and I think, and I think wine actually has kind of saved me to some degree. Um, I burned out pretty hardcore from teaching, and uh, and wine has given me an opportunity to kind of find myself again. Mm -hmm. So I'm I have gratitude for wine. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about why you started wine in the first place. Said you came out here in 2004. Mm -hmm. What was it about? What what brought you here to Oregon? So uh, my wife and I were, uh, we lived in Chicago. We graduated from Northwestern and uh, moved right downtown. And uh, I had a corporate job in a health insurance cubicle world. And uh, I quickly knew, knew that was not for me. And so I got into the restaurant business. I was trying to figure my, my way. And I happened to work for some really great restaurants at the time that uh, were wine oriented and I didn't really know much about it but I knew that if I learned it and I could sell it I made more money so to me it was this very sort of pragmatic thing um, but then I, I was quickly I got sort of the bug about food and wine pairing and um, I had uh, at the time I was working for a, a new uh, Milanese uh, high fashion restaurant called Folia it's now defunct but um, and it was an all Italian list. And uh, I eventually became sort of the, the meter D of sorts and the head wine guy. And when the restaurant had opened, it was a, uh, we didn't have our wine license yet. So it was like a BYO. And then we finally got our license and my boss said, you're the wine buyer. <laughs> and I don't have like, at the time, this is back in 2000 ish. You know, uh, people, you know, there weren't a lot of Somalia. You know, I didn't have a certification of any kind. I didn't have my W set. I didn't have any of that. Uh, and how I learned about wine was uh, I uh, had distributors come and just line it up. And I said, tell me, show me everything from Friuli, man, you know? And I learned by doing. And I, I researched it. I, I, I bought books. And, uh, but I developed my palate mainly through trial and error. And, I like to think that I really developed a nice palate because I de developed a nice list and um, and I thought that was that was my bag. Um, however, after like a couple more blizzards <laughs> um, and realizing I could never like afford a house, 
uh, in Chicago. Uh, my wife and I were just kind of like, you know, we got to try something different. And at that point, a couple of years had gone by, and I was working at a different restaurant that had, uh, I was working at Crofton on Wills for uh, Susie Crofton, really esteemed Chicago um, chef. And she had a whole page dedicated to Oregon Pinot Noir. So this is 2003, 2004, but right before I moved out here. And that was well ahead of the curve for that kind of focus on Oregon Pinot Noir. You know, if you had, you went to a restaurant, they'd have a couple here and there, but she, a whole page of a very lengthy list, all Pinot Noir. So I was selling Ken Wright, and Adelsheim, and uh, you know, uh, Patricia Green at the time. I mean, that was some sort of hot stuff, you know, and like, and I was getting to know all those producers from T doing, you know, tableside sales. And I became, I went from an Italian wine guy to a overly smitten Oregon Pinot Noir fan. <laughs> uh, and I didn't know anything about Burgundy because I had worked at an Italian place before. So uh, my Burgundy knowledge is not great. Uh, but man, I, I started knowing Oregon. Um, and so uh, when the like third blizzard hit, <laughs> <laughs> um, I applied, and this was back, this was all via snail mail. Uh, I applied to all of the wineries in Oregon, all the wineries in Walla Walla, and all the wineries actually in the Finger Lakes of New York. And I, cause I figured, um, I know how to buy wine. I know how to sell wine. I know how to drink wine. Um, I, I want to try to learn how to make it. Like I, I just thought it was the next sort of evolution and try something out. I was still you know, early 20s at that point, and, uh, or maybe mid-20s. Uh, and I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be in the restaurant industry my whole life. So, gave it a shot. Mm -hmm. And two wineries called me. Uh, Pepper Bridge in Walla Walla and Domain Serene. And uh, it was actually Drew Voigt who uh, called me. And uh, um, our conversation was, was great. And uh, Pinot Noir is what I, but you know, was really uh, again kind of smitten with at that time, and so it was a no no brainer. Mm -hmm. I had never been to Oregon. I saw pictures, <laughs> um, and I took three days. I drove out here, and I arrived on August fifteenth of two thousand four. I still remember the day. Pulled up to Domain Serene's parking lot. Drew was there waiting for me. Uh, and I actually lived on the Domain Serene property for harvest. And I did, I did my first harvest there. And that's what got me out here. I came out, my wife was finishing her master's degree in Chicago, and I think she had like a, another blizzard or something. And I was out here and had a great summer <laughs> and learned how to make some, some vino. So tell me, about, uh, tell me about that experience. Tell me about the making experience and, and being at Domain Serene and being in the Wyoming Valley, all those things kind of hitting at once. Yeah, so I mean, it was pretty overwhelming to some degree. Um, I wanted to taste everywhere and uh, it blew my mind. Uh, I remember the first time I, uh, I was told, well, you know, the coast is only an hour away. And I was like, what? You know, <laughs> and I drove an hour and I was like, oh, like I'd never seen the Pacific, or at least in the, you know, I had an LA or something, but you know, like, there's a grandiosity in the Oregon coast that I had never seen before. Um, but you know, my experience at Domain Serene was, was great. It was a really good crew. Um, you know, uh, I got to work with Tony Reinders and of course Drew, um, who is still very much a mentor and friend. Um, and we had a really great crew of, of, of folks that have all gone like to, to do their own things. Um, I, I couldn't have asked for a better place to, to learn, to be honest. I mean, um, the Evanstads really put a, a great amount of uh, energy into the resources that they have. They have very high expectations, and I think having high expectations is, is you know, it's, it's like rigor in a classroom, right? You know, if it, you don't want it to be easy, you know, you, 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 you want to have something that you aspire to. And even if you're the guy like cleaning the drains, like those drains better be the cleanest they've ever been, right? That's the expectation. Um, but I mean, I got in, I ended up being there for three years. And in those three years, I got to learn, uh, you know, the lab work, doing, you know, all the geeky stuff from checking alcohols and using a spec and uh, all those things that they would teach you in a class. I got, I got paid to learn how to do that, right? Um, I uh, did all the barrel work, you know, I was the low guy in the totem pole and 
So I actually got to be pretty intimate with those wines, uh, particularly after three years. Um, but soup to nuts, uh, you know, I got to learn the entire process. And, you know, to me, I, you know, at the end of harvest, I would have assumed, okay, it was a temporary gig, that's the expectation. And I was uh, very grateful that they liked me enough to keep me on. Mm -hmm. And I think in hindsight, the value in the conversations that I have with uh, fellow winemakers, you know, there's harvest and then there's everything else that happens in the other 10 months. And those things that happen in those other 10 months are just as important, mm -hmm. if not more important to some, to some degree. Uh, you know, what are you doing? What's the cycle of the business? Mm -hmm. um, you know, why are you doing X in the spring? And, you know, why are you doing Y in the fall? You know, uh, you know wh wh why are you thinking three months ahead? You know, it's, it's a very different thing because harvest is all about like, every day is kind of, kind of like ground, that movie Groundhog Day, right? Um, at least when you're at the low guy on the totem <laughs> pole. But beyond that, if you can kind of get the, um, the big picture and pull back, um, you know, you can start, I mean, I'm already thinking about Harvest 2020. I just finished Harvest, you know, I'm already thinking about what do I have to do to get to that next, that next stage, right? And I don't know if I would have had that perspective at least so early on if it wasn't for my experience at Demand Serene mm -hmm. and their willingness to, to really train me. Um, I do not have an, uh, an enology degree. I took a couple classes at Chemeketa, but I. I honestly felt like what I learned as a foundational winemaking education, I, I got it. I, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean that I learned everything, right? We're all still, mm -hmm. you still, you know, modify, and there's still plenty of things for me to learn. But uh, I, in hindsight, now realize like I, I landed in a great spot to to get the bug and to and to learn and and, and to get the skills. Was the process of making wine about what you expected or about what you hoped for? Um, that's such a good question. Um, I, uh, I mean, no. I mean, I think the simple answer is no. Um, I really, really enjoyed it, though. I mean, I, uh, I was, I felt like I was in pretty good shape, and like at the time, I was also younger. Uh, it was uh, the weather was great that year, you know, like. Um, <laughs> It, it was a really good crew. Um, so particularly that first harvest, I was I was really into it. Uh, for me, for me, my biggest my biggest. Uh, so I guess I guess uh, what I would not have realized to really fully flesh that that question out. Um, I knew I had done a little bit of research at the time. Of, you know what I could expect. I knew that it was not this romantic thing. Um, I I probably wasn't fully. I was probably naive at the time about how redundant it can be and tedious. And there were definitely times where my patience wore out. Uh, I didn't see, I couldn't see the forest through the trees, so to speak, at that time. Like, so I, I you know, um, I think we had, let's say we had a, a thousand barrels, you know, 500 barrels, who cares? It doesn't matter. A lot of barrels, right? <laughs> When we had to, you know, we were doing batonage, you know, I was the guy that had to go and do that. And, you know, and after a hundred barrels, you're kind of like, I'm kind of over this. <laughs> it's, it's a tedium. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's more tedious when you're not fully invested mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. right? Sure. You're, you're a worker bee. And so you just look at it as like, oh man, I can't wait to be done with this, right? Um, and you know the, the thing in winemaking is, as soon as you're done with, you know, uh, one project, you either going right back to the beginning to do it again, right, uh, or you're just moving on to something else that's not very romantic and, and mundane. Um, I I dig those things now, <laughs> like, uh, and I think I think it's just a it's just a, a point of context and 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 feeling empowered um, in my in my. Uh, other other jobs at other wineries and and, and here at uh, in my capacity at Day Wines, you know, I feel uh, empowered to be a team member, and so like I don't I don't mind doing those those little tedious things because to me they're fascinating now, right? And I see the connection, and it kind of gets to that big picture 
perspective again, right? It's not just this thing like, oh God, I've got to go do that again. It's, oh man, like this is important. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe how, how efficiently can I do it? Like maybe that's the challenge, mm -hmm. like, but it has to be done and there's no, there's no wiggle room here. Um, and so I think I, that would probably be the biggest thing. Like there would be moments of ennui, you know, uh, as, a, as a low seller rat, uh, and I just didn't have, I just didn't have the, the big picture of it mm -hmm. um, at that point. Um, yeah, but you know, the, the, the sad thing is, is that I, I was catching the bug and I was learning a lot and, um, and for all intents and purposes, I thought I'd be staying in wine. And then my third harvest at Domaine Serene, I was developing a, a hip a problem that started off as just like once a month, I'd just be, I have this sharp pain and i kind of hobble around and, you know, I was a cyclist, so I, I would figure it out. Mm -hmm. And then uh, increasingly, because particularly wine work is you're on your feet and I'm jumping up and down and stuff. And uh, uh, there came a point and I remember this pretty vividly, um, where I, I could not walk. Uh, I was running, I was kind of like in charge of the sorting line at the time, and um, I, I just could not flat out walk. And we had a, we had a, t a temp worker who, who was going to acupuncture school. He was like doing sorting line stuff just to pay his bills. And uh, he would, we would go to like a, a utility like closet, and I would just like lay down, and he would just throw pins in me. <laughs> You know, on a break, you know, just like to survive. I got free acupuncture because the, the guy was like, dude, I, I can help you. It'll, I'll learn off of you. And I'm like, I just, whatever. Just, <laughs> I just, but uh, sadly, that really affected my perspective on wine, not because of wine, but because of what seemed to be now this unfair inability to participate. Mm -hmm. um, and then long story short, I ended up having to have reconstructive hip surgery. Uh, I've had two surgeries, uh, and uh, so I was like 31, and or 32 maybe at that point, and um, I mean, I was in traction, and I could, I, then I really could not walk, and um, and so Domain Serene, I I am very grateful for this because I don't know what they were, what they should have done with me. Well, what they did was they said well, we we like you, we want you to stay here. I couldn't do any of the wine work. <laughs> So uh, they put me on a desk and I did compliance work, which is, again, another tedium. Um, but it's one that a lot of people don't know how to do. And I learned how to do compliance. And, um, but I was sitting at a desk. And um, that to me was, I just had to kind of have this more pragmatic, you know, I, I had to have a discussion with myself. You know, if, uh, is, this, is this my wine career? Um, this is what I wanted to be because for all I knew at that point, you know, I wasn't going to really be able to, to walk again. Mm -hmm. um, I was, you know, so I, uh, I, that's where I chose to go get my master's in education and I thought, you know what, I have, I have an English degree, I'm going to go save the world from bad grammar. And uh, I went to, going? Uh, <laughs> I had some successes, <laughs> some dangling modifiers here and there, but you know. Um, Actually, I really love teaching, but uh, uh, you know that that effectively took me out of the wine biz, um, and uh, you know, and I don't know what I would have done. I mean, in hindsight, I, I was walking with a cane for a couple of years, mm -hmm. you know. So, had I already been an established winemaker, you know, I think you can get around and like, you know, you have people work, you know. But I was still just cutting my teeth, mm -hmm. and and so sadly, I had I had to and my career mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and pursue something else. Mm -hmm. um, but I, that, was a, that was a great experience. And it's, and it's still, I reflect on what I learned at Domain Serene frequently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your time away. Tell me about your time in the classroom. Um, so I, I was a high school English teacher uh, in Dallas High School. Mm -hmm. um, so a small rural mm -hmm. district outside of Salem. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I went at it, man. Uh, to, me, to me, there's a Venn diagram of like harvest and teaching. But like teaching is like a nine month harvest, right? Because uh, I equally did not have weekends. Um, you know, as an English teacher, uh, I got to teach writing, which means that I'm grading writing 
constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but I also got to teach like advanced placement mm -hmm. uh, lit. So I was teaching Hamlet. Uh, I got to teach The Road by Cormac McCarthy and uh, really freak kids out. That was great. Uh, about a dystopian, you know, society. Um, uh, you know, I, I still to this day, I, I'm teaching Hamlet. I have, I have students that still uh, connect with me and we talk about the things that we, you know, the, the, the world's problems that we solved via Shakespeare. I mean, there's something very palpable about, um, about having moments with a class where you all are in the learning together, you know, because it's not just about like conveying, you know, this is what it means. It's what do you think? And then, oh, I'm older than you. And I didn't think about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of how I approached it. And, uh, you know, initially I, I, I had a ball. It's, it was nerdy. It was academic. Um, it probably ruined uh, you know, I hyper hyper analyze novels to the point where I'm super critical of endings of novels, uh, and so it might have ruined fiction for me <laughs> in in that regard. But I mean, wine wine making make is kind of the same. Like you know, all you can all you're looking for are the flaws all the time. You just sit down and enjoy it, right? But uh, I really enjoyed uh, working with students, and um, I was there for six years. Um, I ended up. Um, climbing the little the, the little ladder, I was super ambitious. Um, became what was the department chair after my third year, and I really embraced that. I got on committees, and uh, then the, you know the economy fell apart, and so there was all these cuts, and so there was a point where I had over 200 students, and. I did not realize at the time that I was uh, not connecting with my little family. Mm -hmm. I was not being a very present husband or father mm -hmm. uh, or friend. Um, I, I was just in the weeds all the time. And um, turns out um, I, was de I developed a, an anxiety disorder <laughs> that I did not know I had. <laughs> so um, it was this really great gig that was all consuming and uh and i mean part of that's the passion you bring to it but it was just i couldn't there, i could never i have i have a tattoo of sisyphus on my on my forearm and that's i felt like it was sisyphean mm -hmm. it was you know you chip away at at the work and you never were doing it good enough and you were you it was never going away um, and the stress just broke me mm -hmm. um, to a point where uh, I took a medical leave of absence. Uh, it was just, I, it was not good, not a good spot. And I thought I was going to do that for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> so um, thankfully, uh, one of my best friends, Brad Ford of Illahi, mm -hmm. um, he uh, reached out and he said, seems like you need a positive distraction. I could use some help at Harvest. Uh, he knew that I knew what, what to do in a cellar. And so I climbed on board and did Harvest at Illahi. And very quickly, uh, Brad actually was like, you're the associate winemaker. You're, you're in charge, run the crew. <laughs> and it clicked, you know? And so, it's like, so this is, I think, when you asked why wine earlier, um, at that point, wine and uh kudos to to brad ford uh I, i'm always in debt to him for this uh but wine wine saved me to be quite honest for myself um and that got me back in and got and got me um got me back in car hearts <laughs> out of the tweed i did have a tweed jacket with the i still have it with the elbow it's one of my favorites um, i've been trying to figure out like if there's ever an event that i can bust that out but some sort of literature and wine kind of event. Maybe. Maybe it's what you need. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'll have to think about that. <laughs> Not the road, though. That's just too dark. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't know what wine compliments. Nothing by Corbeck McCarthy. I think that's probably a good idea, right? <laughs> so tell me about that process of kind of coming back into the industry and, and eventually ending where you are now with, with your own label, et cetera. Yeah, so, well, that's... <laughs> so, uh, so my label is called Ricochet for a reason. Uh, you know, life my life certainly it does not go in a straight line and occupationally i mean you know people rib me my my closest friends you know rib me and they're like so uh what are you gonna what are you gonna do for uh, occupation next year you know 
and there was a point where I, I always laughed along, and uh, but then it started grating on me. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta, I do have to figure this out. Um, and I, you know, I was dealing with my own little personal demons, uh, and um, which I still am dealing with. You know, it's not like a anxiety disorder just goes away. Uh, so, so for me. Um, in the first being away for six years doesn't seem like a lot of time, but from what was going on in the valley here and where people were going, like so people you know that I worked with at Demian Serene now had their own brands, and you know other people that I knew, like everything was kind of they were all going on this, the the trajectory that perhaps I might have been on had I not taken myself out of the industry. Um, and I lost connections. I mean, I think that's kind of human nature. You know, you, you really Im immerse yourself with people in your industry. You know, you, you hang out with like-minded people and, you know, I'm pretty sure like CPAs are hanging out with CPAs and, um, I could be wrong about that. But uh, it seems to me that people in the wine industry definitely, there, there's a subculture there and they hang out and teachers do the same. And so. Those six years that I was teaching, I, I lost a lot of those connections. Not to say friendships, but people, you know, you're busy, life, life moves on. Mm -hmm. um, and so coming back into it, I, um, it was great to get back into the cellar um, and start working uh, with Brad and, and like we would nerd out on, on what's going on and uh, you know, with the wines and you know, coming back into sort of that, um, into the, the, the visceral side of winemaking was great. Um, but I also kind of felt uh, like a rookie again, not, not as, far, as far as experience, but from, uh, I just felt disconnected. Mm -hmm. There were also like now 500 more wineries, you know, like everything expanded. And I, I just was not, I was not up to speed, I guess, mm -hmm. on where the industry was. Um, but also, thankfully, you know, as soon as I got back into making wine, you know, a lot of those friends from the wine industry, like, hey, there you are again. Like, so, it, you know, you get back and you kind of hit the ground running again as far as some of that goes. Um, I spent, um, so, you know, my gratitude for Illahi saving my bacon. Um, I was there, I ended up being there for three harvests. Um, and, um, I left again because of this existential crisis, again, or what my friends would joke about, it, but potentially an existential crisis. I got a phone call to, uh, from like a, not like a headhunter, but someone was recommended to call me out of the blue. Uh, it was a weekend call uh, during the holidays in December. Uh, we had just wrapped up harvest, and uh, maybe it was after the, like an open house weekend. Mm -hmm. And I get this random call asking, "Would I like to try teaching um, students that are incarcerated in juvenile in a, the Marion County Juvenile Detention Center?" Mm -hmm. And at first, I was like, "What? No, I sorry, I'm doing wine." And then they're like, "Well, we're going to pay you handsomely," and so that was the thing. And then in talking about it, and I did some research, uh, I, you know, I felt badly for not succeeding at teaching. I, I had this guilt mm -hmm. and an itch that I still felt like I had to scratch. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't leave on my own terms. Mm -hmm. And so um, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna save the world, not from bad grammar now, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna like fix juvie. <laughs> Naive, super naive, super naive. Um, but with good intentions. Yeah, I know. Well, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, I suppose, right? Or what's the Mice and Men? Uh, uh, Why Am I Blank in the Robert Burns uh, poem? Um, it'll come to me. It's about intentions. Um, so I made a very hard decision. Uh, I, I kind of... You know, Brad was and is uh, my best friend. I was working with my best friend, um, and I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna leave again and take this gig. And 
that was a really hard decision, and in hindsight, not the right decision uh, at all. Um, I lasted six months, and guess what came right back? <laughs> that anxiety, right? Um, it was a really rigid system. You know, I was locked in the, I was locked in jail with the students. It was a single room, um, 16 students, age 12 to 24, um, and I had to like teach them a five-paragraph essay, and that wasn't happening, right? Um, I really enjoyed the experience, actually, of the kids. Um, they made some mistakes, and a lot of them, you know, were looking to fix that. Um, but man, just being, I couldn't, I couldn't leave, I couldn't, and uh, that's just not how I work. I just, I'm, I can't, I cannot work in a box mm -hmm. at all. Um, it's not how my brain works. Um, and I think that's, that's where winemaking kind of comes in, you know? It's like, you can, you can be dogmatic about, you know how you approach winemaking, but if you if you're if you are approaching it from like a recipe, you know um, that's that's a box, you know, and you can't do that. And, and here I was, literally in a box without windows, and um, I realized my mistake that I should have stayed. And thankfully, um, uh, Illy he brought me back to be a consulting winemaker for that harvest, um, but it was just for that harvest. Um, and then I, you know, from there, um, it was really hard to find a job because I left a job that no one wants to leave. I mean, people are moving here in droves. Uh, you can pay them in peanuts because they want to be in the wine industry. And um, because I had left Illahi, whatever timing, you know, maybe I, I don't know if the economy, I can't remember where the economy was at that point, but. The timing of that decision, there was there was there were no jobs to be had, and so I went between substitute teaching to pay for the bills. Um, then I worked harvest. I worked harvest for Andrew Rich, Andrew Voigt in the same vintage. That was 2017, uh, but I, I just was a harvest grunt, helping out where I could. Um, you know, I would help out on bottling lines, and uh, you know, I just I just tried to stay busy. I collected unemployment. You know, I, I was in a really scary spot. You know, I had blown I had blown some occupational capital mm -hmm. um, in a way, and um, you know, so I, I didn't know I didn't know what was going to happen. But I knew. I, I the funny thing about regret, I think, is you know, man, it opens your eyes right away. So even though you can't step in the same river twice. Um, there are other rivers, <laughs> right? And um, all it did it was it ensured in me that I knew what I had to pursue was getting back into wine. And with the hope that one day, I think what I, I realized was that I would love to be fully entre entrepreneurial at some point. It doesn't have to be right now, but like at some point just to own something. <laughs> Because I think that's where the anxiety comes from. Everything that I was doing was being micromanaged and controlled by everyone else, regardless of my efforts, mm -hmm. right? And in wine, your efforts are directly correlated to the, to the product. How hard you think about it, how hard you work, how neurotic you are about it, you know? How much OCD you got about sanitation, all of those things are, are correlated to the to the end result. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that's what drives me. That's, that's what I find fascinating about wine. I think it's, and I think it's unique. You know, I don't know how many other industries you see that. Maybe construction, you know, or finished carpentry or something where like, here's my effort, here's my precision, and, and here's this thing I made that's beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in that really crazy time, I was just looking for anything, and then thankfully, um, uh, I saw an ad that Brianne put out there and um, for an assistant winemaker, and we clicked right away. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, I hope she'd agree with this, but it's, you know, we felt I felt like we were almost like we had been friends for a really long time, um, and uh, and we still have a really great relationship, and I think that's that's important. Um, but she. Uh, you know, had this opportunity and brought me on to be sort of the, you know, conciliary and day-to-day -day guy, and um, and we have this great relationship where 
you know, uh, we look at, you know, we do sensory trials and we're looking at data and we're nerding out on it and we have the opportunity, you know, Brianne is, is working with uh, vari varietals I'm, I've never worked with before, so it's totally, you know, scratching that curiosity itch mm -hmm. of always being a lifelong learner. Like, I, I had never made a Vermentino. Everything I learned was Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Pinot Gris for the most part, right? Like, so here, here now, expanding that that wealth of knowledge from a production standpoint, um, and then you know, um, Brand Brand had had the generosity to allow me to to make some wine on the side, and um, originally I wasn't going to sell it. I was just, I wanted to have my own thing, you know? I just wanted to prove to myself that I could make wine for myself uh, with my money on the line, right? Um, and so originally I just did some, I uh, just did a Pinot and a Gruner and um, I had friends help me buy the fruit and I was just gonna spread the wealth at, at cost. Um, I ended up being the biggest shareholder and at the end of it, like my friends who helped me out a little bit, they got like $40 Pinot for like nine bucks. So great, right? But I had the opportunity to make a Pinot, my Pinot. Uh, what I, it's the reason I moved out here. I moved out here to learn how to make Pinot. And I've been assisting other wineries to making Pinot. And now here was my own, right? Uh, and man, I gotta tell you, that is a, it's, it is, it, it sends, uh, I get goosebumps when I pour it and people love it. Um, and it's not an ego trip at all. It's, it's, it's actually the same feeling of when uh, a 16 year old reading the Scarlet Letter uh, tells you what it means and you go, oh my gosh, yes. You know, to me, again, my life is all like Venn diagram experiences. Like to me, it's that, there's just an authenticity there of, of um, I don't know, spirit for lack of a better word, connection. Um, but it was, it's mine, right? So, um, Brianne then allowed me to, so I have my share, right? So Brianne tasted my Gruner. She said, you should do this legitimately. And now here I am talking to you. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the short, just, the short Just that straight and simple. That's just, just that. Well, for the back end there, I mean, so, I mean, I, uh, I just launched Ricochet during Harvest of 2019. So I had, you know, I, I had my 2018, uh, I came on board here at Day Wines uh, right before the 2018 uh, harvest. And uh, so I made my little side hustle wine. Those are now my current releases. I've made some more 2019. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, ju I just launched this sucker. Um, and um, it's crazy. The momentum is crazy. The um, I can't turn my brain off. I think that's the entrepreneurial side of it. Um, my parents were both small business owners and I remember going on vacations, you know, to the beach, right? Myrtle Beach, right? You're supposed to just lay out there and get a tan and do nothing. And my, you know, my folks would just be on the phone, like making deals. <laughs> so, and I kind of get it. Like you're, I'm thinking about the wine all the time. I'm thinking about what I got to do next. I got, you know, I'm thinking about like a website. Like I, these are all new things and it's all part and parcel of the wine industry. It's, and, and, and that, 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 that goes to the point of, you know, it's not just harvest, right? Like w what are all the other things those other 10 months? What are, what are the cycles? What do you have to do? And a lot of, there's a lot of things that I'm, they are not in my bailiwick at all, uh, but I got to figure it out, you know, and that's the challenge. And that's kind of, that's, it's fun. It's, it's again, it's like a positive stress. Mm -hmm. It's a non anxiety inducing stress. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm a baby brand, uh, which is kind of funny because, you know, there are plenty of new brands coming out and uh, I have uh, friends and colleagues uh, launching their own brands and, um, uh, but I, I, age wise, like I'm the old guy, I, I've been here for 15 years. I just had a hiatus, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but yet I am still a baby when it comes to the brand mm -hmm. and where it goes from here, we'll, We'll see. So you had all these, all this time to kind of develop what your wine should be, what your style should be. Mm -hmm. When it finally came time to make your Pinot Noir, what was that style? How would you describe your winemaking style, your winemaking philosophy? Um, 
Well, I, first of all, I, I mean, I think the more that I can make, I mean, it would be great. The, the benefit of, say, having worked for a large winery is that you have the ability to play around a little bit. You know, if you're doing a thousand cases of Pinot Noir, you, you have the ability to say, you know what, this year I'm going to do the same thing every year, but maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch things up on this. I just want to see what happens, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right now I don't really have that flexibility. Um, I just have the accumulation of having worked at different places with different styles and how, how I want to approach that. Um, I, I, I look at Oregon Pinot Noir as something that, man, is the perfect, you know, it's threading the needle between an opulent, you know, like California, like Russia, Russian River, really ripe mm -hmm. uh, Pinot, and um, a really, you know, bright, uh, you know, burgundy that needs some time. Um, I want my Pinots to have body, but I don't want them to, uh, I want them to be in balance, which I feel like has kind of become like a cliched, you know, I'm sure a lot of folks probably use that, but I think, I think it's true to form. I mean, I want, I want my wines to have the acidity on the finish. They gotta be food wines. Um, but I also want the fruit to be there so you can enjoy it. If you just want to have a glass of Pinot on a cold night uh, by the fire, um, I, I want it to have that versatility. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not using a lot of oak. I don't plan on that right now. Some of that is financial, but, um, I really don't foresee myself, uh, intervening too much with uh, adding a lot of oak. Um, because that just means that you gotta, you know, there's, there's, you're, you're adding more sharp tannins to the wine that, uh, you know, could enhance the structure, but now. Um, maybe maybe it's not as easy to enjoy it on its own or uh, earlier on. Um, I uh, more importantly, I want my wine. I want to make sophisticated Pinot Noir. I want people to, when they, you know, purchase a bottle or they, I, I pour them a glass. I, you know, I want them to savor it. I want them to think about it at least for a hot second. And then they can quaff it. Um, that's fine. But I, you know, I think I think I would like to think that most people that are making wine are looking for a momentary pause of, huh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whatever that is, yum or yuck. You know, I, you know, I don't. I can get just as nerdy and esoteric with the metaphors as anyone else. I generally don't like to do that. You know, I, uh, particularly in conversing about wine, I just want people to pa take a moment and go. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they can't even articulate why. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can't. But um, so I want the wines to be accessible in that way. Um, I want my wines to be affordable um, as well. I think that's part of it. That's not really about the winemaking so much. But you know, I, uh, wine's not pedestrian by any means. But I think it can be proletarian. <laughs> I think it can be for. I, I think more and more people want access to this varietal that has established this valley. Um, but there's a lot of Pinot Noir out here that's beautiful that a lot of people will never have because they can't afford it. It's, it's just too much. Um, and so, so I, I want to do my best to make sure that I'm making wine that's versatile, sophisticated, and accessible, uh, whatever that means. So you make a Pinot Noir and then you make a, a Gruner. So my first, me, yeah, my tell, first wine. Tell yeah. me what, about why that was and how you chose. Yeah, well, um, I so I had the privilege of uh, making Gruner at Illahi, and I really liked the style uh, of uh, of that wine. I like Gruner a lot. Uh, Gruner is one of those uh, varietals that I could drink every day. It's quaffable, right? Um, I still want my wine to be a food wine, right? Um, I mean, the Austrians will drink Gruner, you know, in a in a water glass, right? It doesn't have this pretension, um, and I just have, definitely don't think I want my Gruner to be pretentious in any way. I don't think it can be, uh, but. Um, I just I just think it's a fun grape, and I think it grows really well in the Willamette Valley. I think more people should plant it. More people should plant it so I can buy more. That'd be great because uh, it's kind of hard to find right now. Um, it's also just different. I think I think um, I could have done a Pinot Gris. 
Um, it's my first white wine. I, I, want, I, I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, nothing against Pinot Gris, but if I did a Pinot Gris, then there'd be nothing to really differentiate me or my brand. And, and I think right now people are really, particularly locally, it's different if you're talking about the national marketplace, mm -hmm. but locally consumers are looking for more uh, diversity and varietals. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thought about that as well. Um, but in the end, I just I just like Griner. Um, I want to make it all. I want to make more of it, and uh, and uh, and people seem to dig it too. I, again, I think because it can be it can be you know a little patio sipper. But if you want to go with your Thai food, it's it's great. You know, it's a fun wine. So where have you uh, you talk about struggling to find gr Gruner grapes? Tell me about finding grapes to source and uh, and perhaps uh, future plans to expand. Yeah, uh, you know, right now I'm kind of limited by um, budget, right? Um, you know, my ultimate goal, I, you know, I want to source from, from, from vineyards that are thinking about their practices. So I'm not necessarily uh, rigid on it has to be certified organic or live certified or biodynamic. Um, there are a lot of people who are farming with some degree of sustainability or they're using organic practices and they don't have that certification. I applaud the folks that do get the certification and I would love to, you know, buy, you know patronize everyone who really dives in. Um, but I've had really good conversations with, with uh, growers and, uh, you know, uh, one source that I have for 2019 is surrounded by biodynamic vineyards. Um, they're not uh, they're not biodynamic, but they're composting in their in their uh, fields. They they're not using Roundup. They um, they're taking great care. They're they're, they're 30 year old vines. Um, they don't have that stamp, you know. Um, but for me, it's the conversation with the grower, like, what are you doing? And what's the data that you have to show that what you're doing is not impacting the mother nature uh, negatively and is, and is affecting the grapes positively. Um, and, you know, I think again, it's the same as being in that box. You know, if, if people, I think it's human nature to say, well, this is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, I, I actually kind of prefer the folks that are really like listening to what's going on and going, all right, well, maybe we do have to adjust our approach. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think the, I think the whole thing with like Roundup, uh, is a great example of that. I mean, you could be live certified and still be spraying your vineyard rows to make them look pretty. Um, and people are really thinking about that, you know, it's like a carcinogen. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's actually the, the deal breaker. Like th that's more important to me than which of those certifications that you have. Mm -hmm. And then I'm looking for, I'm looking for vineyards that, um, you know, I would love to work with Shea or Temperance Hill, right? I mean, those are the lofty vineyards. They've been around, they're established, they produce amazing fruit. Um, but I'm also, I've been reaching out to folks that are just th trying to get started themselves, smaller, smaller vineyards that are, they're looking for relationships. They're looking for long-term relationships that are mutually beneficial. And uh, I'm a new guy, you know? So like, I'm, I kind of like that idea. If I can start a relationship uh, with a grower that evolves over time, you know, that just allows me to get to know the vineyard more as I grow with them and we can have those conversations. And, um, but I'm, right now, right now I'm, you know, I'm sourcing fruit from where I can, I can get it, and I'm sourcing it from places that I think are doing a great job um, on their site and doing it, and doing it right on their site. Mm -hmm. So you also, you also give back to the community through the wine you sell. So tell, mm -hmm. me, tell me about uh, where, where that goes to and why. Sure. So, so when I came with, when I thought about starting the brand, um, I still have that community or social justice itch that teaching gave me, or my little time in juvie, teaching in juvie, not my time in juvie. Uh, and, uh, you know, wine is a luxury good, right? 
Um, not everyone enjoys it. Most of my friends are like blue collar, you know, folks, or they are folks that do not, they, they don't drink wine the way that I and my wine friends do, right? And so, um, to a lot of people, the wine industry is this other world, right? I want to bring it down. I want, I want to bring it down. <laughs> but I want to, I want to, I want to, uh, <laughs> that doesn't sound good. Uh, no, but I want to, I think wine, again, should have this, this, be a little bit more connected to the community and it's that access point, right? And I want to be able to still be connected in some way to knowing that I'm doing something to make the community better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right now, the only way I can think about that is contributing 5% of what I make to local nonprofit social justice organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then bringing awareness to them. So right now, you know, I'm not making a lot. My profits are you know, kind of you know, low because um, I'm just starting. But, but there's also just getting attention to organizations that need the attention. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as much as I personally might donate to, say, Mercy Corps, and they're doing great work, they don't need my help, right? So I want this to be about Yanhill County or the Valley. I want it to be about home. Mm -hmm. I've lived here longer than anywhere else I've lived growing up. So this is my home, uh, and I want to help take care of it. And so Ricochet is all about me sort of bouncing back into the wine industry, but it's also about helping people that need to bounce back as well. And uh, presently, I'm linked up with an organization called the Remnant Initiatives. They are based in Newburgh. They got started in 2017. They're new. And they uh, work with formerly incarcerated Yan Hill County citizens to get housing jobs. They meet, they meet, um, they meet uh, their their clients uh, on their release day from jail or prison and get them clothing and get them to a safe spot and, and, uh, and basically get them on their way. And mm -hmm. there's not a lot of resources for that. And I, I think what I saw in my time in the criminal justice system, like that's, that's an area that I'm more than happy to try to shed some light on. Absolutely. So you mentioned, uh, when you're talking about your winemaking philosophy, you, you talked about sort of what you want a customer or, or, or a drinker of your wine to, to react. So tell me about the early reactions to your wine and, and how, your, how your early uh, sales and marketing and just sort of being out in the community is, is going. Oh man, um, I, uh, I'm amazed. And I've been, I've been uh, trying not to say I'm humbled because I feel like uh, that word is being misappropriated these days. Like when, when like people get elected to this, or higher office, they're like, "I'm humbled," and you're just like, "No, you're not. You're not humbled because being humbled means like you're 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 bringing yourself down a peg." But I don't, I can't think of another word. I'm certainly grateful. Um, it's been good, and I, again, I just got started. But the 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 reactions to my two single wines right now, my Pinot and my Gruner. Um, you know, I had a little launch party, and then I did a little pop-up, and uh, I'm getting placements in Portland. And my very first trip up to Portland, uh, I went to f five places, and I sold at four of them. And I'm, an, I'm new, you know? Like, so it was in, it's been incredibly validating so far. Uh, it, it's kind of like a runner's high, I think, except I'm not a runner. But, you know, I just feel like my adrenaline is... Uh, you know, I, I can't turn my brain off, but a lot of it's because of, a, of this very positive feedback. And I want to I keep that momentum, not just from a business standpoint, but like, okay, how do I do that again? So the stuff I have in barrel, like, I want to I make sure, like, if I made something that people dig, I, I, I this is going to sound weird, but I owe it to them to be consistent, mm -hmm. right? I owe it to myself from a professional standpoint, but that's the whole point, right? Like, I want to I wanna be known for certain wines, for a certain style, um, or a certain approach. And if people like my stuff and they go, well, d where's the next stuff? I, I want to be able to deliver on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but right now, um, you know, I just did an event last night. Uh, people, people are, it's resonating. The wines are resonating with people beyond 
I don't even know if I had expectations, to be honest. I mean, again, this whole thing started off as a friends and family you know, little thing. Like, it wasn't, this, this wasn't supposed to happen <laughs> yet. Or, right? Like, it wasn't, um, this all happened with Brianne giving me a green light that I, I, that I did not even solicit. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, I'm super grateful because now, now I have I have this thing that's my own, and I have traction, and um, and all that's going to do is allow me to you know you keep it just goes right back into paying the bills, right? And and then maybe I can get the, the you know access to those vineyards that I would love to work with or what have you, right? So um, maybe it's a self fulfilling prophecy. I don't know, but but right now things are good. I'm going to knock on copper. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a over the moon, to be honest. So you mentioned the, the event last night, the Just Pressed Wine Fest. Tell me a little bit about what, the, what the, 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 the event was about and sort of what you got out of it, being part of it. Oh, man. Um, I got so many things out of it from both a winemaker with the consumers, right, and then a winemaker among winemakers. Mm -hmm. um, so the first part, so the, the event was this, is this super cool idea where you bring finished wine, you know, just like any other like portfolio tasting, you know, and people come and they taste your stuff and then they can buy it. But you also bring barrel samples of your current stuff. It's called Just Pressed. So it's your 2019. The wines might not even be done with primary or malolactic. And uh, you're letting them taste the wine that they cannot buy, but it's this sort of nerdy, academic, and I'd say almost outreach to consumers, like this is the process. Um, I really commend Jess at Olympia Provisions for coming up with this idea. I, and I think this is, it's the teacher in me. I mean, it is, you know, showing people, I was showing paper chromatography of the wine they were drinking. I mean, like, see, this is where that one is, and, and this other one is here, and this is what's going on, and this is why you're getting this sort of affect. and um, and. That resonates with people, and it wasn't just the wine buyers and you know the wine you know aficionados. Um, there were plenty of people there that uh, they're like malolactic, what you know, and and you just kind of explain it, but then you give them a visual, or you you say, okay, taste this. This is happening right now. Now here's the finished wine. It's the same varietal from the year before. That's what it's like finished, and you know I think, I mean that's again. The, that to me is the root of wine. It's that fascination. It's that conversation in the bottle. It's, it's so different. Like people don't necessarily do that with other things. And it's that if you're taking a moment, you're savoring it, you're thinking about it, and then you're having fun. It's a good time, right? <laughs> um, so I got. It, it was great to um, be able to pour my 2019. So I had my barrel sample of my next Gruner next to the Gruner they could buy, right? And just to kind of, for my own sake, just to kind of get that, that real life feedback. Like, are you digging what's going on? Because this, this is what's going on, <laughs> right? It's done. Um, and then to do that with the Pinots, um, I just think it was fun. It was educational. Um, um, and I, I, I think it's good for sort of like the wine marketplace. Because mm -hmm. I still think even people who collect wine might not fully understand that say, when a Pinot Noir is in the middle of malolactic fermentation, it does not smell like, it's, it, it smells like Werther's Originals, you know? It's like, it has, like the, you know, it's, it's going through this process, and if you are un, unaware of that process, you might go, whoa, this is, what's going on with this, right? Um, it's, it goes through its funky little middle school years. And uh, <laughs> to be able to explain that to people and have them go, oh, you know, like, uh, it's, it's cool. Um, and then it felt really great. Um, so thankfully, the Oregonian just did an article on uh, myself and two other colleagues that just launched brands. That, that dropped on Friday, I think. Um, and so yesterday, I, I felt um, back in the community, in the wine community. Um, not that I haven't been, um, but um, I felt like I was an equal with all the other amazing winemakers in the valley. And they got to taste my wine, and I got to taste theirs, and um, 
it's that collegiality and that and being connected. Um, if it was um, maybe that was maybe that was humbling in hindsight. When I drove home, I, I didn't have the radio on. I drove home from Portland. I live in McMinnville, and I just really ruminated on um, on that part. It was really um, that was really special. So what's next for you? Do you what are your what are your plans as you look say ten years down the road for yourself for your brand? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I probably should actually come up with a business plan. <laughs> uh, note to self. Uh, I haven't thought too far down the future, um, which I, 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 I should do that. Um, I, I, want, I want to grow the brand, obviously. You know, um, what size? I, I, don't, I don't want to speculate uh, now because uh, I don't want to be too big and I don't want to be too small. You know, I want to be Goldilocks on that one. Um, but I, you know, I, I want to make consistently good single varietal wines. I want to make some fun blends, um, um, and I, I have this vision of if one day I can run, have my own little tiny winery somewhere, and I could be like the Dave's Killer Bread of wine, and hire people not only who want to learn. How to make wine. So it could be could be students at Linfield, right, um, who really want a tactile experience on a bottling line, <laughs> for whatever reason, <laughs> um, or at Harvest, whatever. But there are there are jobs. I mean, we we've hired people. All the places that I've worked, uh, wineries are great places for apprenticeships. Um, you can learn this trade by doing, and depending on. If you want to be the winemaker, uh, there are people who are happy to be cellar masters, and they're really good at fixing things that break, and um, they know how to, you know, uh, move wine effectively and safely, and and that's where they want to be, and that's a really important job. I would love to be in a position someday to train, to help train people, to teach people, but then give them the opportunity that they might not otherwise have. So. Um, I, w I feel like that would be true, true to form to the, the Ricochet mission from a business and community perspective. Mm -hmm. So I, would, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that looks like. Um, but that's the thing that I am, that's the pipe dream, mm -hmm. you know, to, to have a space that's kind of a sanctuary for learning and for self-improvement. Are there other varietals you're interested in working with? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a slippery slope, man. Um, I want to, you know, I certainly want to focus on Pinot. I know the industry is kind of, uh, you know, bifurcating, if I can use a math term, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are the strictly Pinot Noir and Chardonnay houses, and then, you know, there's a lot of folks kind of going almost entirely the other direction, and, and uh, uh, I moved here for Pinot. Pinot is definitely staying. I, I would like to expand uh, the AVAs, and 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 I think it's really fun. One of the things that I've loved doing, uh, when a, when possible, is when you make say two different, in this case, Pinot Noirs, uh, from so single vineyard Pinot Noirs, from two different or three different uh, vineyards, uh, or maybe sub AVAs. And you make them the same, like you have you you have the same approach, mm -hmm. and then you bottle them, and you, you kind of treat everything like you, you know as equals, barrel aging, all this stuff, and then you present that to consumers. Mm -hmm. And I love just being able to say, you know, these wines all taste very different from one another, and it really has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. That's the nerdy part, you know. So I definitely I definitely want at some point to have the resources to to have, to, to source Pinot Noir from various terroirs. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it's all about. Um, Gruner's, Gruner's staying. Uh, <laughs> for 2019, I added uh, Pinot Blanc, mm -hmm. which I'm still just, I, I did that on a whim last minute, um, but I, I wanted to try something a little bit different. I'm gonna kind of treat that a la Chardonnay. I'm gonna let that just kind of hang out, see what happens. And then I brought in some beautiful Tempranillo from um, 
uh, Coventina Vineyards down in Southern Oregon that Herb Quaddy manages, and uh, I'm super excited about that. And, I, and that's where, like, I think it, it's, you know, I want to I want to focus on the Willamette Valley, but there's some really great stuff going on in Southern Oregon, and um, and I want to I want to have some options there too. You know, in my portfolio, I don't see myself necessarily having so many, like I, because I, I, that's. That's where I, I, I don't have the resources now anyway, but um, you know, there's some fun things I want to do. I think I'd like to try Skin Contact. I played around with a little pet nat. I think there's some fun projects I'd like to throw in there, but I think I'm going to keep it simple for right now. <laughs> simple. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I see a Chardonnay in my future. I mean, I, um, I'm actually not particularly the biggest Chardonnay fan, like as a consumer. It's not the varietal that I order but it's one that I really respect. So it's this weird dichotomy and I, um, I think it would be, I, I, I think I, I, sh I need to get on that. I, and I see Oregon Chardonnay. I love Oregon Chardonnay. I should, I should have framed that differently. Um, and I like Chablis. I like, so I, like, I, think there's, I think that would be kind of neat to, um, to try to make a Chardonnay that is endemic of Oregon's terroir, because mm -hmm. um, again, that's that's why we all moved here. Mm -hmm. It's iconic. Mm -hmm. You have a pretty interesting perspective on the industry, given you've been in it 15 years, sort of. Sort of. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so tell me about kind of your initial impressions of the industry and, and what you've seen change from initial impressions to, to today. Well, first of all, I mean, just the the, the amount of wineries out here. Um, I mean, I can't remember how many there were in 2004. I want to say there's like 250 or something like that. That's about right. And now a thousand or so. I mean, push it 800. Okay, 800. So um, that's a crazy amount of growth. Um, what what I what I have seen in my personal experience when I first moved out here. Um, there were obviously the, the wineries that had established the area, um, you know, you'd go to those. But, you know, if you're just driving around um, and you were following the blue and white signs and you go, oh, I've never heard of this place. Back in 2004, it was still, I feel like the industry was still in its some degree of infancy, uh, particularly as far as quality, a consistency of quality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is not a dig on anyone in particular. I think this is tr true for every, I think the I think the quality overall, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats in this case. But there, back in 2004, uh, another Harvest intern and I, you know, when we first got here, we drove around and it was hit or miss sometimes. Um, and you'd wonder like, how are you guys selling this stuff? And now I don't have that experience. Like the quality of wine, regardless of varietal, um, is above, is, is, has improved. And I think that's because of the collegiality and the, the collaborative nature of the industry. You know, the Oregon Symposium is a good ex example of that. Like we're sharing information with each other. Um, at the dinner after the event yesterday, how did you make that? I really like that. You know, it's not proprietary. We're not, no one's holding their cards to their chest. Um, and I think that is why overall, I, there, there are places that back in 2004, the ones I was like, I don't know, this is, I don't understand how you're doing this. They're making killer wines now. So I think, I think the sort of shared education, you know, on winemaking practices, the science of it, uh, and the art of it, um, mm -hmm. I, I just see, even though there are, are way more wineries now, there is coming, those wines are coming to market through a better understanding of the process, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there are so many wines I have yet to have. I mean, I feel like back in 2004, I, I, I hit every darned winery, man. Like, I was able to do that. I, 250, I got this, you know? Like, uh, and now I just feel like, you know, brands are popping up. My brand has popped up. I am one of those. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's a lot of competition right now. Um, that, you know, that's where you have to make decisions on, you know, I'm making a Gruner, not a Pinot Gris. There's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, but part of that is, you know, if there are eight, you know, 799 other wineries out there, why are people going to come to me? Mm -hmm. You know, 
Um, and I don't know if you'd have to ask people back in the pioneers, but I don't know if that was as much a part of thinking about your portfolio 15 years ago. Um, but I was not privy to those discussions 15 years ago <laughs> as a seller rat. So, um, yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I think, I think the, the, the market is booming and people are, are eager for Oregon stuff. What's, what's interesting to me is I, I hail from Pennsylvania, which is a really hard state to sell wine in. But, um, you know, you, you travel around to other states, Oregon Pinot particularly, but Oregon wines in general, like are still new. It's this new area, you know? So we take it for granted, those of us that have been here, that this is a wine region, right? Uh, it's the next Napa. People have been saying that since 2004 when I showed, this is gonna be the next Napa, and people are still saying it, like as if we're waiting for the terrible traffic, <laughs> right? Uh, but, but for people outside of Oregon, this is still a uh, relatively, you know, unknown area um, on shelf space. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's cool, that's exciting. Uh, it means that Oregon wines are still novel for the vast, you know, uh, amount of, of potential consumers out there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So it's something to think about, you know, we shouldn't take it for granted at all. We should be really, really grateful that we live in this super cool spot. What do you see as you look ahead for Oregon wine then, say the same time period, or is there something you're, uh, do, you have a, do you have a vision for what Oregon wine industry will look like as you, as you age into it? <laughs> do you have to use the word age? <laughs> uh, as you as you've been into it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if I have the ethos to answer that, to be honest. Um, maybe that'd be a question for me five years from now, or 10 years when I'm the Dave's killer bread of wine. <laughs> no, um, I mean, I, I don't see, there's so many factors, right? You know, uh, the economy right now, uh, people, people have money to, to spend more than they did after the recession, right? So, and people, I mean, wineries change their, their portfolios because of the economic downturn. People are sitting on inventory, they, so they made less. Um, you know, so how do you, how do you think about something like that that's out of your control? Um, I do think more and more people are going to be, you know, that 800 is going to increase. More and more people are going to be making wine. Portland, or, you know, ur the urban wine, um, you know, phenomena, for lack of a better term, I think that's going to continue to grow. Um, you know, and I think not just in Portland. I think, you know, I would, I would expect to see more wineries in, in McMinnville proper, um, maybe in Corval Corvallis or, you know, wherever. You know, I think people... Consumers kind of want more of an experience. I think the tasting room, as like an old school tasting room, is possibly, you know, unless you're established, it's a very passive way to sell your wine. You're just expecting people to kind of show up. And what the research shows, particularly with millennial consumers, is that they, they want experience. They don't just want the thing, they want to hang out and enjoy it. So that's either they want the view, mm -hmm. right? Or you better have like a live band or something. I don't know, but I do. I do think that people are going to start figuring out where where to have the production space, and then how how do you how do you interact with people where you can showcase your wines, but also give people an experience. Because um, otherwise, everyone's just hawking hooch. You know, it's. You, I think people are really looking for something to not only Instagram, but, but to, to, to kind of brag about. I just, I did this thing, it was super cool, you should go. Mm -hmm. um, that, that seems to be, there seems to be a, a wave in that direction, mm -hmm. um, which I think would be great, you know, because it doesn't take away anything from the folks that are established and the beautiful estates and, um, because that's what, if you don't, I guess there are more and more people that don't have the estate and you can still make wine, the trick is figuring out, you know, how do you, how do you engage with people in a really cool way. Mm -hmm. Anything you're concerned about as you look ahead? Anything uh, that, that worries you as, you, as you're part of the industry? Um, 
I don't know if it's a concern, but what I what I kind of hear in conversations, whether it's consumers or fellow winemakers or, or buyers, is there's almost a disdain among some folks for the varietals that establish the Lama Valley. There are people who are over Pinot Noir, which blows my mind. <laughs> I can drink Pinot Noir every day. This wool. I think it's a phenomenal varietal. Uh, but I think it's that sort of taking it for granted perspective. Um, I, you know, people are over Pinot Gris and Chardonnay and they're just over it. Or that's what they'll, they'll tell you that. And it's like, man, why in regions? Like, so imagine if the French were just like over Burgundy, you know, over Pinot Noir. Like, that's not a thing. They are deeply proud of the varietals that are, you know, that grow intrinsic, you know, inherently in that region, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're not going, well, this was a good run. <laughs> so let's, let's rip it out and, and, pl and plant something else. Um, I think it's a, it might, maybe it's a uniquely American thing. You know, we, we want something that, things that are novel, but wine, wine, you know, growing grapes is not this thing you can just like, stop on a dime and you know it's it's this long process and then wine making is a process and aging the wine so like it all it takes all this patience and yet there's kind of this if i hear this murmur of like this this impatience with like well why don't we have different varietals right so it's like well there's i would like i would i think we should i think that we should be holding pinot noir to its rightful spot as the as the uh, the air you know or you know and I don't I, I just fear that people are gonna kind of be done with it mm -hmm. just because been there done it experienced it and and that's I hope that's not true I hope I'm optimistic that it won't be but right now people are seemingly kind of talking about that I I mentioned Pinot Gris you know and people are like they're over Pinot Gris you know, it's great, you know, like there's nothing wrong with it. So it just, it's attitudinal. So if you, uh, if someone came to you today and said they were interested in getting into the Oregon wine industry, what would your words of wisdom to them be? <laughs> don't ever quit. Um, <laughs> get in there. Don't ever quit. Um, I, I tell, I have told people, I mean, certainly getting a harvest gig, um, you know, apply to all the wineries. I did. It works. <laughs> Out of 500, I got two responses. <laughs> it's great. Um, there are more opportunities out there. Um, I think right now, certainly, there's actually, uh, it's hard to find people to work because the labor market is what it is. So people are already employed. So, but, you know, wineries need help at random times. So I think it's just, just sign up for a bottling line. Like, you just got to make connections. If there's anything that I have learned so far is that as hackneyed a phrase as it is, it's not necessarily what you know all the time, it's who you know, and it's making those connections. So if, if you can work uh, a bottling line at uh, a winery that, um, that you dig, uh, even though that's really, um, you know, laborious work, mind-numbing work, <laughs> tedious, um, you're gonna be meeting the cellar master or you know the assistant winemaker or the winemaker and you're you're going to show your enthusiasm and you're going to ask really savvy questions and you're going to work hard and you know if a job opens up there's a, a name and a face that you're you're putting out there mm -hmm. so i think it's it's taking on those the cellar rat gigs and and being grateful for it um and then just working your tail off i mean i it's you got to You got to persist. You got to you got to work through the muck, you know, and either you either you get the bug or you don't. And I think I think that's also something that you have to be honest with yourself about. Um, so we had we've had some harvest interns here just recently. And at the end of harvest, they, they worked their tail off. They were awesome. And at the end, they said, I don't think production's for me. I'd rather do sales. Great, you're still you're still getting in the wine industry. Like, who said it has to be production, right? There's so many there's so many other facets to this. Technically, sales is super important. So great, now you understand the process. Start start working a tasting room gig. Like, there are all those entry level positions that I think um, are 
you know, they're great, they're great avenues to, to climb on whatever ladder you want. But it's really meet, meeting people, getting to events, meeting winemakers, demonstrating your enthusiasm. So the questions that I have for you today, is there anything we didn't talk about that we should have, anything I should have asked you that I didn't? Um, I don't think so. I feel like we covered some good ground. Definitely covered some good ground. Well, thank you so much for yeah, your time thank today, you. for, your Appreciate answers, it. for your answers and stories, and uh, congratulations on getting Ricochet off the ground and getting thank some you. good positive early feedback, and uh, we'll look forward to revisiting down the line. I, I, I look forward <laughs> to that. I hope so.